So my name is John Mellicrummy. I'm a professor in the computer science department at Rice University, and I'm going to tell you about the HPC Toolkit performance tools that my group has been developing for really over a decade now. So from the perspective of computational scientists, um, I don't envy you. The, there's a, a rapidly evolving set of, of platforms, and so the multi-core designs are changing a lot. There's a huge number of, of increases in, in cores. There's a lot of architectural diversity. So there's CPUs, GPUs, APUs, which combine both CPU and GPU onto the same chip. There's many core, the Xeon Phi or the Intel Mic, which you may have heard of, the same thing, just two different names. And also the parallel systems are widely, uh, are they're increasing in scale. So the systems like Sequoia and Mira really make um, uh, it daunting for, for application developers to, to scale all the way out. And also it, it poses a, a huge challenge for tools. And so on, on the application side, even if you may be working on a new application, or you may be just working to augment the capabilities of a, a established body of code like the flash code that we heard about earlier, but um, in, in any case, not only are the, the uh, architectures evolving, but your applications are evolving too. And so what you need to be able to do is to adapt to the changes in the emerging architectures and be able to improve your scalability both to larger numbers of cores on the nodes or take advantage of GPUs or to uh, improve your scaling onto these larger scale machines so you can tackle larger problems. And then you need to assess weaknesses in, in your algorithms and implementations and decide where you need to invest your effort if you're going to get the most out of your, your allocation on these systems. And so performance tools can really play an important role as a guide in deciding where and how to invest your effort. And so on uh, today's architectures, they're, they're very hard to use efficiently. So we have complex node architectures with multi-level parallelism. You've got multiple cores, instruction level parallelism, short vector units on the, on, uh, the Intel processors and on the BlueGene Q. You've got accelerators like the Intel Mic and, and GPUs a multi-level memory hierarchy. And so as a result, the, the gap between what's the possible uh, performance you can achieve and what you actually achieve is huge. And so typical scientific codes might get, say, 5% um, of peak if they haven't been tuned. Um, a well-tuned code, you might bring it up to 25% of peak with a lot of effort. And so there's a factor of five in there, and so that can, that can make or break um, how well you, you succeed with your allocation and whether you get your science done. And so with the, the complexity of the architecture, well, the applications are complex as well. And so systems like Flash, where there's hundreds of thousands of lines of code and pluggable modules and, and whatnot. So these are challenges for both measuring and, and analyzing your code and understanding their behavior so that you can tune their performance. And then on systems like Mira and, and Titan, you're interested not just in the computation, but also in the data movement and the communication and the I.O. And so we have to be able to capture information about all of them. So what I would argue that you want are, are easy to use multiple multi-platform machine independent programming model um, independent tools so that you can use them with MPI or there's um, trends nowadays to use uh, unified parallel C or Coarray Fortran and so you'd like to be able to use the same tools regardless of what programming model you're using. And you'd like to have accurate measurement of, of complex parallel codes and that um, the codes may have a mixture of C++ and, and Fortran you may have uh, heterogeneous parallelism within and across nodes if you're using, say, GPUs and, and your, uh, your CPUs. And the only code that it makes sense to actually measure the performance of is, is optimized code. Because if uh, you turn on the optimizer and you get a factor of three performance improvement, then it doesn't make any sense to turn off the optimizer and then measure the performance of your code. So what you want to be able to do is compile your code sort of flat out the way you'd like to run it on the system as a production code and then measure its performance that way and then find out what's left that you actually have to pay attention to because the compiler couldn't get it. And so you need to deal with um, the fact that some of the libraries are available only in binary form. Sometimes they're partially stripped like the, the GPU code. 
And you're looking for some tools that are going to be able to provide some insightful analysis and pinpoint and explain problems. And so you need to correlate any performance measurements with the code in order to figure out what you're going to do about it. And so I would argue often for scientific codes, that means taking the, the uh, performance measurements and showing them at the loop level, because the loop level are where you can make changes in scientific codes. And so we show things at the level of loops, procedures, call chains, and several different views, as I'll, I'll get into in a few minutes. And then the tools have to scale to these large-scale machines. And as uh, Mike mentioned, we, we can collect for a fraction of processes rather than collecting for all. And that's one of the ways that we, we deal with scaling. So what our HPC Toolkit performance tools do, and I should make a, a, a point of saying that there's actually two sets of tools called HPC Toolkit. There's ours from Rice University. And then IBM also has something that they call HPC Toolkit, except that they have a space between HPC and Toolkit. We both chose our names back in 2001. We both just like searched the web and didn't find anybody that had the same name. And so at any rate, if you search the web now, you'll find that ours is the number one hit. So we don't care what IBM calls their tool. <laughs> so <That's free. laughs> and, and ours is free. But not as free as you'd think. So we'll be talking to you about a support <laughs> contract. <laughs> so. Um, what our, our tool does is it employs binary level measurement and analysis. And so what you're doing is you're observing executions of, of optimized code. And it supports multi multilingual codes with uh, libraries that are available in binary only form. It uses sampling based measurement, as the previous speakers said. And so with sampling, you get controllable overhead because you can decide what your sampling frequency is. You can decide, I want to sample a thousand times a second. A second or a hundred times a second, or I want to sample using hardware counters and say every three million instructions or every two million L2 cache misses. And so by dialing up the the the, uh, the, the period, you can reduce the, the sampling frequency and reduce your overhead. And so um, I, since we work on multiple architectures, we haven't set any, uh, any particular sampling rates. And if you have an application that's running for 10 seconds, you may want to sample it a lot more than an application that's going to run for two hours. Because in order to make the kinds of, of judgments that you need when doing performance analysis, what you need is, is a useful number of samples. And so how you acquire that number of samples, whether it's with a low frequency or a high frequency, sort of depends on what your runtime is. So we leave that as a knob that you can turn and if you find that your program's slowing down too much when, when sampling with a, a particular period, then you can just increase the period as, as you see fit. So it's got controllable overhead. It uh, minimizes um, systematic error by avoiding blind spots. So you see the time that's spent not only in your application program, but in all the, all the things in libc, all of the math libraries you use, whatever. And in order to collect performance information, you, you can find out where you're spending your time just by collecting something like wall clock time. But often to get into the, the details of, well, am I spending my time well, you need to use hardware performance counters. And so that means collecting multiple metrics, not, not just one metric like time. Often you'll need to collect floating point operations or L2 misses or cycles or things like that and look at the ratios of these things to decide how well your uh, application is doing. Well, although I'll show you, you can do a lot with, with just time. And then we associate these metrics with both uh, static and dynamic context. And so loop nests are a unique thing to our tool. We can also associate uh, costs with inline code as well, and then support top-down performance analysis. So let me give you a, a brief overview. And so this is not going to be a manual for how to use the tool. This will give you a flavor for how to use it. There's some more detailed instructions online in our manual and also um, at the ALCF uh, website. And I'll be around this evening if anybody's interested in giving it a try. So this is going to be sort of a hand-waving how, how it all works. And I'll do a couple of live demos if I can squeeze them in and, uh, and tell you some of the things that you can do with our toolkit. So, this is the, the workflow overall. So you start out with your source code and you compile and link it the way you, you normally do. And so for uh, dynamically linked executables as you would use on a, a Linux cluster, then that's all there is to it. You just use your normal make files and then you launch your, uh, your application with uh, a launcher script that we provide. 
Now for statically linked executables, you need to take the, the code for the performance tool and link it in your application. And for that, we have this uh, tool called HPC link that you add as a prefix to your link line. So you just put it in, in the, the link line of your, your make file, you just say HPC link and then your normal compile command after it. And that's all you need to do. No compiler wrappers, no, no serious changing of your build process. Then the second thing you do is once you've got uh, either your dynamically linked executable, in which case you launch it with our HPC run tool. And so in the middle, there's a, an example here that shows how to use HPC run with uh, MPI. And so you can launch your MPI job. And so here we're launching a copy of Flash 3. And then you just say HPC run, and then you say what event you want. So this says I want to measure wall clock at um, a period of 5,000 microseconds. And then I also want to collect a trace. And I just insert that into the middle of my um, MPI run command, and then it will collect information about every process in the execution. If you're doing this with uh, statically linked applications, then the information about what events you're using, say the wall clock, and that you're doing tracing, instead you set that in environment variables because we don't have a, a, a way to pass them on the command line. And so when the program executes, then you collect statistical call path profiles of the events of interest. And so I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that. So with call path profiling, what you're doing is you're measuring and attributing costs in context. So you're setting up a timer or a hardware counter to periodically overflow. So what happens is the, the timer or the hardware counter will go off and it will trigger an interrupt. And we'll find out that we're at some program counter location and then um, we want to know that I was in some routine C when called from B, when called from A, when called from main. And so that tells me exactly where the costs were incurred. And so if I have an application that's got MPI all over it, knowing that I'm in MPI weight doesn't really do me much good. What I need to know is which MPI weight is a problem. And so the calling context is really important to collect to understand where your problems are. And so that's what happens for an individual sample when we get an interrupt, we find out where you were and we attribute the cost to the context. And then over the, the entire execution, we'll collect up something that we call a calling context tree. And so conceptually, you can think of main being up at the top and then this might be the initialization phase and this might be the solver phase and all the interior nodes represent routines or call sites and then all of the leads here represent where costs are incurred. And so what we're collecting is a tree with weights on it during the execution. And the important thing is that collecting this information is proportional to the sampling frequency, not the calling frequency. So it doesn't matter whether you have small procedures. It just ma it matters what you've set as your, uh, your timer um, period or your hardware counter period. So then the next thing you do is you run our HPC struct tool. And what this does, this is a, a unique tool to HPC Toolkit. So it does binary analysis of your executable. And so we analyze the machine code, we, we parse the machine instructions, we rebuild the control flow graph for your code, we figure out where the loop nests are, we identify inline code, we figure out what um, statements are inside loops. And so this isn't the source code view, this is actually how the code is going to execute. So you might have several Fortran 90 statements that are um, adjacent in the code, and if the compiler fuses them all into a single loop, you'll see that that's what comes out of our binary analyzer. It'll tell you about these, these fused loop nests. And then it maps the transformed loops and procedures back to the, the source code. And so we use this information along with the call path profile in order to interpret the measurements that we've made. So then once we have our call path profile, our dynamic measurement, and then we have our static program structure, we have two tools that combine them. So there's HPC Prof and HPC Prof MPI. And so what HPC Prof does is it runs on the, the head node and it will, it will combine multiple profiles or multiple trace files and, and uh, knit the results together into this uh, performance database. And then HPC Prof MPI is for dealing with large scale executions where you launch this as a batch job and it's going to analyze your performance data in batch. And so 
that's when you've got thousands of profiles and you don't want to wait a couple of hours while it analyzes on a head node. You can just launch a job and analyze it in, in minutes. So what, um, what this enables you to do is to combine information about multiple threads, multiple processes, multiple executions, and then correlate everything to both the static and dynamic structure. So then finally, we have two presentation tools. You can explore the performance data from multiple perspectives. You can rank order the, the metrics by what's important. So you can say, I want to see the procedures where I spend the most time sorted up at the top. And so this is to try and deal with information overload. If you've got really big applications, what you really want to do is just focus on what's important. And so sorting, you get to define your own metrics, and you get to sort by them, and that lets you focus on, on what's important. So we can see something from a code-centric view, from a thread-centric view, um, and also from a time-centric view, and I'll show you what these, these tools look like. So I understand from my student, um, Kartik, that you had a little bit of exposure to Chombo over the last week. And so what this is showing is the, uh, the HPC viewer view of a 1024 core run of Chombo. And so what we have here, it's a little bit washed out on the screen. There's uh, three panes. There's a source pane up at the top. There's a navigation pane. And so what this is showing you is um, elaborated call chains. And so this is what we did is we took these calling context tree for all of the 1024 cores and we mashed them all together. And now we're looking at where you spent your time across all of the 1024 cores sort of summed together. And we have summed metrics and mean and min and max and whatnot. And so you can, you can look at these, these uh, statistics across all of them. And then you can also graph um, data across the individual cores as well. And I'll show you that in just a minute. And then so we have our, our navigation pane. And so if I select something over here, then I'll find the, the source code will come up that corresponds to it. And I can sort by these metrics to, to uh, see what's important. Then there's several different views here. There's, um, there's some view control, so you can look at um, look down call chains, you can look up call chains, or you can look at, at flat, and I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then there's also some control for um, computing derived metrics, or if you've got lots of metrics columns, you can just hide them so that you can just focus on the one or two that you care about. You may have one that's sort of scrolled way off the screen, and you can move it over to the left where you can see it, or hide everything else in between. And then um, the thing that you get with HPC Toolkit, which is uh, a consequence of using this HPC struct binary analysis, is not only do we get call chains, but we also get information about loops in call chains. And then the green here shows that there's inline code as well. And so not only do we see the call chains, but we see the loops and the inline code that's in the call chains. And we get that from our binary analysis where we're recovering loops and information about inline code. And so this costs nothing because essentially we're collecting these dynamic call chains at runtime and then we're just overlaying this additional information we got from static analysis. So it doesn't cost anything to collect at runtime to give you loop level performance information. So I mentioned that there are three different views. So the calling context view, you're looking down call chains and so that's good at, at seeing things like how much time that I spend in the initialization phase or the solve phase or the post-process phase. The caller's view where you're looking up the call chain is, so I spent 30% of my time in MPI wait. And there's lots of different MPI waits in the program. And rather than searching down the call chain and trying to find them all, you say, looking up from MPI wait, I spent 30% of my time here. So where, look, let's look at the different places it's called and which ones are most important. Okay, so that's looking up the call chains. And then the flat view says, well, so I don't care how this thing was called. What I want to know is how much time was spent in here and let, let me look at the loop nests in this, in this procedure. And so you can see just sort of what's important in the procedure when it's used from all of the contexts in the program. Okay, so then how do we use these tools? So let me talk about pinpointing scalability bottlenecks as that's something that's relevant here. So, the, the problem is that as you scale to larger numbers of processors, now this slide was made several years ago, and so 
This is only scaling out to 65K, which I guess is sort of a toy system these days. Um, so what you want is as you add additional processors, what you want is your parallel efficiency to be one. So as I double the number of processors, I want double the performance. And so if I'm running it on a, a fixed size problem, I want my execution time to half. And so actually when you run on a larger system, what you'll find is often, it's often the case that the, your actual scaling tapers off. And so you're not getting the full benefit of every core. And so what you want to know is what's the gap? And where is it in my program? And how can I fix it? So you want to be able to isolate scalability bottlenecks, figure out where they are in your code, and then quantify the magnitude of each problem. And so that's something that, that we've solved here. So the challenge for pinpointing scalability bottlenecks is you've got lots of different layers of software. So we have, so th let's say we have this climate code here. So there's a main program and it's calling a land simulation, a CI simulation, ocean simulation, and atmosphere simulation. Then there's calls to MPI weight down in each of them. And so we need to be able to know which of the MPI weights in, in the program is a problem. So we need to understand the context. And then when we're monitoring, a challenge is, well, we want to be able to identify bottlenecks, whether they're due to computation, data movement, synchronization, or whatever, replicated, replicated computation. Um, so, and the pragmatic constraints are that we can't collect a huge amount of data, and we don't want to perturb the execution. So how are we going to do this? Well, the idea is really simple in, in hindsight. So you have some expectations about what's going to happen with your code. So I suppose you talked about strong scaling and weak scaling previously. Is that true? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll review it briefly here. So with strong scaling, when you, you're, you're taking the same size problem and then you run it on uh, um, your application on a larger number of processors. OK, with weak scaling, when you double the number of processors, you double the size of the problem so that each processor has a constant amount of work. And so those are two different ways that you might scale your code. So you could take your fixed size problem and then keep running it on larger, larger numbers of processors and say, how come I'm not getting the full benefit? Or you can take your, um, your weak scaling problem and you say, well, I run it on um, a problem of, of size k on, on so many cores. Now I double the number of cores and I double the problem size and I want it to run at about the same time to get a higher fidelity simulation. And so in either of those cases, you have some expectations of how the performance is, is going to uh, work out. So if you're using strong scaling, when you double the number of processors, you expect it to take half the time. When you're using weak scaling, you expect it to take the same amount of time. And so you can express your expectations as an equation and then compute the deviation uh, from your expectations in every calling context in the program. And then our, our tool can correlate all that with the source code, and then you can explore this interactively. So, so here's the idea. So let's say we collect this calling context tree on P processors. And so I've shaded the nodes a little bit to indicate sort of the, the weight that was associated with each of the node. And so we have some, some weights on the, the tree saying this is our cost at, at each of these uh, places in the calling context tree. And then we collect it on a larger number of processors. And we get a different set of weights. And so then we can difference the two and say, what's the difference between them? So it might be that in the small scale execution, I spend 400K units of time in the solver. You can't really see the, the pink highlighting on, with this projector. And then in the larger scale execution, you may spend 600K units of time in the solver over here. And then so what that gives you is the difference of 200K units of time. and so. What this amounts to is wasted effort. And so if we take this wasted effort and we divide it by the total effort that we put in in the entire execution, then we get a fraction of wasted effort. Okay? That's telling us why we're deviating from that perfect scaling. And with our fraction of wasted effort, if that's also the same thing as scalability loss. So we take our fraction, we multiply it by, by 100, and now we're, we're looking at our, our percent uh, scaling loss. So this works for strong scaling as well. You just have to throw a couple of, of coefficients in, in front of the equation. So let me show you how this actually works. So this is for the flash code that was talked about before lunch. So it's a structured AMR code and uh, 
This is a, a simulation of a white dwarf detonation, and we're comparing scaling of 256 cores to 8K cores on a blue gene P system. Okay, this is going to be a little bit small, but I, I think you'll, you'll get the idea anyway. So what we have here is um, there's a, a calling context tree for the, uh, in the navigation pane, and so right now I'm looking at the root of the calling context tree. And so what we have here are a couple of columns. We have results, measurements of where we spent our time on 256 cores, where we spent our time on eight cores. This is a weak scaling experiment. And so we expected the time to be exactly the same on 256 cores as on 8K cores, because as we increase the number of cores, we proportionally increase the size of the problem. And so this is larger than that, which means that we have some scaling loss and we want to find out where it is. And so with our tool, we can dig through and we can look at, um, at where we spent our time for 256 cores or where we spent our time for 8K cores. But the real power comes from comparing these two different executions. So I have a spreadsheet like um, there, I pressed the little uh, function button, and that lets me define these little spreadsheet-like equations. And so I'm just going to pull the equation out of the hat. And so it's actually doing the same thing that I showed you earlier. It's differencing the cost in the two trees. It's dividing by the cost that's, um, that's associated with the, the inclusive cost associated with the root in one tree, multiplying by 100. And then that gives me percent scalability loss. And so I was careless in the way I uh, clicked this. And so it gave me the number in scientific notation. I can make it come up without scientific notation. OK, so what this says is that I have a 24% scaling loss in my execution. And if I look, I can see that uh, of that 24% scaling loss, that most of it is in the evolved flash phase and 14% and in the evolved flash phase and 10% in the init flash phase. And so I can say, well, show me where the scaling loss comes from. And it will drill down through the call chains. And it finds a loop nest. and it says that this loop nest is associated with 5% of uh, a 5% scaling loss, which is one fifth of the scaling loss for the entire program. And right above this, it's inside a loop, and we see something that says loop over all processors. And so as we increase the number of processors, then this loop is going to take more time. So what it's actually doing here is there's, as part of the adaptive mesh refinement, um, you end up with a, a block of data. And then there's, you need to know which processors have the neighboring blocks of data after adaptive mesh refinement. And so initially, what they were doing was everybody said, OK, here's the blocks I have. And, I, and they pass that information to their right neighbor. And then the information circles all the way around a ring. So effectively, it's an all-to-all -all communication. But since it's going around a ring, it's taking p, p time steps to go around the ring. And so as you increase the size of, of the number of processors, then there's an increasing number of hops around the ring, and so it doesn't scale so well. So um, that's the, the one problem here. Now, this isn't the only problem. You can look at every individual iota of cost in the application and, and see where its scaling bottlenecks are. So here's another one where there's um, an MPI barrier, and there's also a suggestive, I'm at the end of a loop here. And looking up just a little bit earlier, you see there's um, IO. And it's doing reads. And then there's a loop up at the top that says, let's iterate over all the number of processors. If it's my turn, I'll open the input file. Well, so what happened, I think, was somebody crashed the, the file system by having 20,000 processors open the file at the same time. It would have been better to just read it and broadcast it. OK, so that gives you the, the idea how this, this tool works. So I'm looking at, at data from several different executions and doing comparative analysis, and it will show me where these bottlenecks are. And I can show in the evolve phase that, in fact, it has the same adaptive mesh refinement bottleneck that the other one had in the initialization phase. OK, so this is, that was scalability analysis across processors, but we can also do it within nodes. So you can run it on, um, so this is for, for that case. And so this just this shows that um, the Flash team, given this information, their, uh, their execution time used to go up like this for the block construction. And then when they fixed their block construction to scale,
it was flat, and so the flat is, is scaling. So this is a little while back. So you can also do the scaling on multi-core processors. So if you're running on, say, four cores, and then you scale up to run on 16 cores, you may find that there's not enough uh, bandwidth to, to main memory, and so that may be a bottleneck. So you can compare a four-core run versus a 16-core run, or you can use simultaneous multi-threading and use more hardware threads than cores. So use two threads per core or four threads per core and look at the scaling within a node. And so you do the same thing. You just subtract the calling context trees just like I did, and it can point out the routines in, in the code where there's the worst scaling or even individual loop nests where there's the lowest scaling. So another thing that we do is we use sampling to understand the behavior over time. And so this is very different than the tracing that many other tools do where they'll add tracing in every MPI call or in the front of every function. What we're tracing over time is we're tracing samples. And so the, the rationale for this is that with profiling, you're collapsing out the time dimension. And so you may lose some information about how um, you ended up with a particular profile. So you might not understand how this particular profile arose. So what we do is we trace call path samples. So at any individual sample, we'll, we'll get an interrupt and we'll collect a call chain for a process. And then a next time interval will collect another call chain. And so we end up with a series of call chains for, for one thread and for each of the threads in the entire application. And so the way you look at these is it provides this multi-resolution view of what's going on. If we take our visibility plane and we lift it all the way up to the top, all of the dots are blue. And what that means is like everybody's in main, so the, the dots represent um, a procedure and the colors represent what procedure we're in. And so if I lift up this visibility plane all the way up to the top, I'll find that everybody is in main or things main called for the entire application. And as I move the plane down, I start to see things at, at a finer level of abstraction. So let me show you how this works in practice. So this is an execution of, of uh, a P Flowtran, which is a groundwater flow application developed primarily at Los Alamos. So what this is showing us is an execution of 8K cores for about 20 minutes. And so what we see over here is a call chain, and that call chain corresponds to this particular point in time. So that is uh, process 4,163 at 667 seconds into the execution. Okay. And then what this is showing us on the bottom is the series of call chains over time for an individual process. Now, I don't have enough pixels here to display 8K processes, so what we're actually doing is we're sampling when we're rendering the display as well. So we look at, every, so we say we have a thousand pixels, so we're gonna show you a thousand points in, in your execution. And so this is showing that everybody is in main for the entire time. So we have threads on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. So this looks pretty uninteresting at the moment. Now, if I move down main calls P Flowtran, which is the Fortran main, I move down another level of abstraction and we move out to, this is showing just a, a small fraction of the execution. So if I show the whole execution, so you see that there's a little something different. There's a flex of a little different color over here during the initialization. And then the rest of this is the time stepper module. I move down one more level of abstraction and now we can see there's two colors and one represents flow simulation, the other represents transport simulation. If I move down further, we find that, well, actually both of them are calling Petsy. And so in fact, we have this very long call chain that's deep down into, into Petsy. And so what this is showing us is, is how um, the application evolves over time. So if I move up and just uh, pick some small part of the execution to focus on a couple of flow and transport iterations. And this is, this is about eight gigabytes of data for uh, these 8K cores and I'm visualizing it interactively on my laptop. So I can move down a couple of levels and so you can see in fact, now there's even more detail of what's going on inside Petsy and you can see, so one of these was the flow and one of these was the, the transport. Um, 
And so even though they're both using PETSI, they're in fact using PETSI very differently. So let me just go back up to the flow and transport. And so you can see the red is transport and this is, is <coughs> flow. And so even though they're both using PETSI, they're using it very differently. And then you can zoom way in and see details about this as well. And so what we're doing is we're sampling over time and we're, and so now we have this ability to render hierarchical views of, of the application over time. And so we're not doing any clock synchronization between the processes and so it's, it's shown a little bit skewed here and that's something that, uh, that we could do in, uh, in a post-mortem fashion. But uh, this whole trace was collected in uh, about 5% overhead. And so it's, it's because we're only tracing about 200 samples a second. And so, but you can still see how the behavior evolves over time. So I'll just, uh, one last thing, I'm gonna zoom in on the uh, initialization phase and, and show you a detail of that. So what we have here, there's a call to MPI all reduce, and so that's this dark green. And so what we have here is load imbalance where nobody is finishing this phase until everybody finishes the earlier phase. And so we see these, these irregular splotches of this, this dark green. And what it is is everybody's entering a reduction. Some of them finish with the, with the previous phase earlier. Some of them finish very late. But all of this section means that somebody's, that some processors are, are waiting around for other processors to arrive. So you can visually see load imbalance this way as well as you can see load imbalance in the, in the profiles as well. Okay. Running short on time, so I'm just going to go through some of this uh, very quickly. So to assess process variability, there are a couple of different ways you can do it. So using the trace viewer that I just showed you, sometimes you can see it visually. This is a, a, uh, a sorting routine. It's doing radix sort, and it's not running on a power of two processors. Some processors get a double load of work from the others, so we can see that there. We can also see it in a thread-centric view that's uh, graphed in HPC viewer, where we can see that some threads are spending longer in the, the selected context, and you can't see the selection here, but it's, it's the one at the bottom. And so, uh, so there's different ways where you can see load imbalance. And then also we have some support for understanding threading, GPUs, and, and memory hierarchy. And so the problem is that often if you're using sampling to measure something, you'll often measure symptoms. So I'll find that um, some thread is spending a long time waiting for a lock. Well, the waiting for a lock is a symptom. Whoever's holding the lock is the cause. And so what we'd like to do is shift the blame from the symptoms to the causes. And so we want to blame code that's executing when other threads are idle, or blame code that's executed by the lock holder when threads are waiting, or blame processes that arrive late to collectives, or or if uh, the GPU is idle, we want to blame the code that's running on the CPU for not keeping the GPU busy. Similarly, if the CPU is idle, we might want to blame um, whatever kernel is running on the GPU to say that the CPU work is not adequately overlapped. And so the way that we do this, we, we have this, uh, this general technique that we call blame shifting. And so for uh, locks, suppose uh, one thread is, acquires a lock and then releases a lock. In the meantime, some other thread is waiting for it. Well, what we do is we accumulate samples in a, a global hash table that's indexed by the, the lock address. And then upon the release, we transfer the, the lock holder says, has anybody been waiting for this lock? And they, they check in this hash table. They find out how much cost has been attributed to the lock. And they say, it's my bad. And they'll attribute it to the lock release. And so you know at the point that they released the lock that they held up a lot of or a little of, uh, of processors, um, keeping them from, from working. So that's um, directed blame shifting. There's also something called, and so this is just an example that shows how it works for, for locks. And I'm not going to go into this since I'm sort of short on time. So let me explain undirected blame shifting. So, here, consider we have a, a bunch of threads, and I really hate that, the, that uh, the, the color washed out. So this had light purple bars uh, across here, 
And so the black was for idle, and every, every other um, thread was, was working except where shown in the black. And so what would happen is if we took a sample here, all of the threads would be working except for one. And so each thread would say, I get one unit of work. And since there were five threads, they would say, I'm going to charge myself one-fifth of the idleness. There's one thread that's idle. There's five of us that are working. I'll take one-fifth of the blame for my sample. And then they keep doing that all the way through here as their, their sample. There's only one thread idle. And so we keep doing the same thing. And then as more threads become idle, well, here we find that at this point uh, in time that three threads are idle and there are three threads working. And so we get one sample of work and then three idle threads, we divide up the blame for it. So we get three thirds is, is one unit of idleness. And then when more threads are idle, um, so what we're doing here is by just maintaining a count that says how many threads are idle and how many threads are working, then when a thread is working, he says, is there any idleness out there? Let me take my part of the blame. And so what that's doing is it's shifting the blame from the threads that are sitting idle to what code is executing while the threads are idle. And we can show that in the, the source code oriented view. OK. So we do the same sort of thing for GPUs. And I'm not going to get a chance to go into the details. But the important thing here is that it may be the case that for the, the longest kernel might be overlapped with a lot of CPU work. And there might be some shorter kernel where the CPU is sitting idle. And so if you shorten this kernel, then you can shorten the whole execution. If you shorten this kernel, the only, um, the only amount of, uh, of, of improvement you'll get is the synchronization time. So if I make this kernel any shorter, then it's not going to help. Whereas this kernel, I can bring it all the way back to here, and that'll shorten my execution time. And so what we can do is, is tell you that's where you should be tuning your code. So um, we've, we've used our, both our trace-based tools and our blame-shifting-based tools to identify problems on both um, Keenland and on, uh, on Titan. We identified a hardware problem. This was showing where GPUs were not seeded properly, and so the data transfers on certain nodes were taking longer. And so this uh, actually corresponds to time for a CUDA mem copy. And so it turned out that the, the boards weren't set right. And so, uh, so there was a hardware problem that our tool showed. And then using the blame shifting, we found that, uh, that dynamic memory allocation was taking a significant fraction of the execution time on, uh, on uh, Lawrence Livermore's Lulesh code. And so what we found was that the GPU was idle when you were using CUDA malloc. And we also have a way of attributing costs back to data. And so this is using the hardware counters. And what we can do is say that, um, that a certain, here's a fraction of the, the latency that's attributed to a particular variable. And then we can attribute it not just to the variable, but also to individual source code lines that are touching the variable. Now, this is a really useful capability. You can't use it on very many machines. It turns out that um, the kernel capabilities that are needed to get this data out of the hardware counters um, are hard to come by. They were in kernel, Linux kernels through 2.6.30, and now they're coming back in 3.10. And none of the machines you're working with have anything like that. And so. Sorry, you can't get this data on Titan or on BlueGeneQ, but um, we, keep, we keep working with the, the vendors to see if we can get these capabilities um, into their OSs. OK, so um, to wrap up, I, I told you that using this uh, sampling-based methods is surprisingly powerful. You can find out not just where you're spending your time, but identify scalability bottlenecks or where there's problems with parallelism or lock contention or load imbalance or um, understanding the temporal dynamics, uh, finding bottlenecks in hybrid code, finding uh, bottlenecks associated with data, and, um, and attribute all of that back to full calling context. And so these tools run on the leadership computing facilities today, and they also can run on your Linux cluster. There's a, a number of challenges ahead, but I won't steal Al's thunder, because I think he's going to talk about some of that in the, the next talk after the break. Thank you. Thank you.